So in this lecture, we shall be focusing on three key moments of revelation in Mark's gospel. They are moments of revelation that occur at critical points in the story of Jesus, as Mark tells it. The first one, close to the beginning of the story, and the first episode in which Jesus himself features, is the vision that Jesus receives at the time of his baptism. The last of the three, the tearing of the veil of the temple and the confession of the centurion, occurs at the time of Jesus' death and is, of course, therefore close to the end of the gospel. The second of the three mo moments of revelation, the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountaintop, occurs at what is usually regarded as the midpoint of Mark's story. These are not the only moments of revelation in the gospel. One could certainly also think of the message of the, uh, the message the angel gives to the women at the tomb right at the end of the gospel. But these three key moments seem to be highlighted by Mark and deliberately linked as a series of events in which the core meaning of Mark's story comes to light. So that you have all three of them in mind as we proceed, we shall first of all read through all three of the passages. So first, the vision at the baptism. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with whom, with, with you, I am well pleased. Secondly, the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to, to, to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. and From the cloud there came a voice, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And finally, the centurion's confession. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. Now there are several features of these narratives that tie them together. In the first two of them, we hear the voice of God. And these are the only times in Mark's gospel in which God himself speaks. In both of these cases, God refers to Jesus as his beloved son. Again, only in these two passages of the gospel. Both are declarations that Jesus is God's son, and the same is true of the third passage, where it is not God, but the centurion at the cross, who declares Jesus to be God's son. So there is a difference in the third case, but all three are revelations of Jesus' sonship to God. You might think on that evidence that the baptism and the transfiguration belong closely together, but that the third is less closely connected. But Mark also writes in such a way as to tie the first and the last of these three moments of revelation closely together. In Jesus' vision at his baptism, Jesus sees the heavens torn apart. That's a very unusual phrase, and we'll come back to it. 
More often in the Bible, visions occur when the heavens are opened. And in fact, that's the word that Matthew and Luke use in their versions of Jesus' vision of baptism. But Mark has this strikingly violent image of the sky torn apart. The Greek verb itself, schizo, is only used 11 times in the New Testament and only twice by Mark. Once here and again at 1538 where he uses the same verb to describe the extraordinary event that occurred in the temple at the time of Jesus' death. The veil was torn in two. Surely this is a deliberate echo, a verbal indication of a connection between the two events. There's also another verbal link in the word pneuma, which means spirit. At the baptism, Jesus sees the spirit of God come down onto him. And then uh, God calls him his beloved son. The moment of Jesus' death, Mark describes by means of a verb related to the word spirit. He says that Jesus expired. Actually, there's the same verbal link in English, spirit expired, they have the same root. Jesus breathed his last, it's translated. A basic meaning of pneuma is breath. And ek pneumo means to breathe out. So Jesus breathed out, breathed his last breath of life left him. And the, and the centurion, seeing as Mark emphasizes how Jesus expired, declared him to be God's son. Again, the verb ek pneuo is quite unusual. Mark uses it only here, and it occurs only once elsewhere in the New Testament when Luke also uses it with reference to Jesus' death. I think Mark has made a deliberate verbal link. So it seems to me very clear that Mark has described these three events as a series that in a way structure the whole story. The first and the last of the three enclosing most of the story and the second occurring significantly at the midpoint of the story. So let's think first now about the baptism. There is something very special about Mark's story of Jesus' baptism and vision. It's Jesus' first appearance in the gospel. But it's not just Jesus' first appearance. It's an appearance, if I can use that term, of all three persons of the Trinity. That's using later language, of course, that Mark would not have recognized. But I think it's a legitimate reading of the story. This is a Trinitarian event. In Christian art, it's often been depicted as a Trinitarian event with all three persons appearing. So in this stained glass window from um, Holy Trinity Cathedral in Addis Ababa, the spirit, of course, appears as a dove. I must say, I prefer it when Christian art does not attempt to depict the face of God the Father. In the gospel story, the father is invisible, though we hear his voice. In this depiction, we have a merely symbolic view of heaven and the voice of God coming down from heaven. Well, I said it is a Trinitarian event. It's not a static representation of the Trinity in eternity or in heaven. It's the beginning of the Trinitarian story that Mark's gospel tells. Up until this point in the biblical story, God has not been perceived as Trinity because he did not in the Old Testament story act in a way that reveals him as Trinity. As Christians, we may look back on that story and we may see some hints of the Trinity in it, but they could not have been seen at the time. What brought the early Christians to understand God as Trinity was the story that Mark and the other Gospels tell, the story of Jesus, because here God made himself known through Jesus. The eternal relationship of the Father and the Son within the Trinity now took, as it were, earthly form 
in the human Jesus and his relationship with his Father. And the Spirit of God came to be known as the Spirit that empowered Jesus and the Spirit that Jesus himself gave to his disciples. So here at the outset of Jesus' ministry, the three divine actors in the story make their appearance. The story takes place on earth, but it's initiated from heaven. Jesus sees the heavens torn apart. He does not, like some biblical visionaries, see into heaven. He doesn't see the throne of God in heaven. What he sees is the Spirit of God coming down out of heaven in the form of a dove. Now, two questions about the way that Mark describes this vision. First, why does he use that verb torn apart, ripped apart, when the way one would expect such a vision to be described would be that he saw the heavens opened? The prophet Ezekiel's vision occurred when he saw heaven opened. Stephen's vision of Jesus at the right hand of God took place when the heaven opened and he was able to see into heaven. And in the book of Revelation, the prophet John sees the heaven opened so that he can go up into heaven. So why does Mark depart from the usual terminology? The answer, I think, is here. Already in his prologue, Mark has signaled that the story is a fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah. The later chapters of Isaiah from chapter 40 onwards are probably for the early Christians the most important part of the Bible. In this passage, the prophet has been speaking on behalf of the faithful within Israel at a time when it seemed as though God had abandoned them. He has been recalling the way God had saved Israel from Egypt in the dramatic events of the Exodus, and he begs God to do something like that again. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your might, the yearning of your heart and your compassion? They are withheld from me. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. In other words, the ancestors of the nation, Abraham and Jacob, seem no longer to care about their descendants. You, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you make us stray from your ways and harden our heart so that we do not fear you? We have long been like those whom you do not rule, like those not called by your name. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. In the days of Moses, God came down onto Mount Sinai and the mountains quaked. The prophet is saying, we need you to do something like that again. He wants God to come down in power to redeem his people again. And the image of tearing the heavens apart is appropriate because it suggests that eruption of divine power into the world. So when Mark uses the same image, it means that the prophet's prayer is at last being answered. No longer are the people to be bereft of the divine presence with them. The mountains are not quaking, the form of this new exodus is not entirely what was expected. And so far, only Jesus knows what is happening. But God has come down from heaven. As the man Jesus, God's son, empowered for ministry by the divine spirit sent from heaven, God is powerfully present among the people once again. The second question about what Jesus sees concerns the dove. Jesus sees the Spirit descend on him like a dove. Does that mean the Spirit is like a dove, or that the Spirit descends in the manner of a dove? The commentators disagree. 
But I think it has to be that Jesus uh, sees the Spirit in the form of a dove. Otherwise, how does he see the Spirit? But the Spirit in this context to be represented as a bird is easily, I think, understandable because a bird could cover the distance from heaven to earth and then perch on Jesus' head. But why a dove? Nowhere else in the Bible or in early Jewish literature is the dove a symbol of the Spirit. This has puzzled scholars for a long time, and none of the suggestions they have come up with seem to be really convincing. So maybe it's just that Jesus saw a dove and the particular species of bird has no significance. But I have a very speculative suggestion of my own to make. I'm not at all sure if this is the right answer, but since I thought of it while preparing the lectures, I might as well share it with you and see what you think. Now, the Hebrew word for dove is Yonah. It's the same as the name Jonah, which means dove. It's Four Hebrew letters, like the divine name, the Tetragrammaton. And three of its letters are the same as three of the letters of the divine name. It looks quite like the divine name. You'll remember probably from my first lecture on the story of the burning bush, that there's a play on words between the word Eche, meaning I am or I will be, and the divine name. And that was a case of uh, a, a word with three letters in common with the four-letter divine name. So my suggestion is that in a period when Jews no longer spoke the divine name but did still write it, it would be easy to see an association between the divine name and the Hebrew word for dove. What better symbol for the spirit of the Lord than a bird whose name resembles the name of the Lord? Well, let's return to the text of Mark and consider the words, of, the words of the voice from heaven that Jesus hears. God calls Jesus his beloved son. Not just, you are my son, which is how God addresses the Messiah in Psalm 2, but you are my beloved son. Moreover, this word beloved Agapetos in the Greek, when used of a son or daughter, often has the sense of an only child. A child who is especially loved because he or she is the parent's only child. So when in the Genesis story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac, the Hebrew calls Isaac Abraham's only son, this is translated in the Greek version of the Old Testament by the word agapetos, beloved. In the Hebrew, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. In the Greek, this becomes, take your beloved son, whom you love. Something similar happens in the story of Jephthah's daughter, which is also a case of a father finding himself obliged to sacrifice a beloved child. The Hebrew says simply that she was Jephthah's only child, but the Greek version says she was his only child very dear to him, again using the word agapetos. The Greek translator, I think, wanted to convey the two aspects of the Hebrew word, indicating both an only child and a beloved child. So we can say, I think, that the heavenly voice in Mark's story declares Jesus to be God's only and beloved son. If other humans or angels might be called sons or daughters of God for various reasons, Jesus is singled out as son in a unique sense, his father's only son, and moreover, dear to his father's heart. For Jesus to be God's son, is no mere status or office, but a profound relationship with his divine father. 
Many scholars say that the title Son of God in Mark is a messianic title that means no more than that Jesus is a human being appointed by God to act as God's agent in bringing salvation. Now, it's true that according to a couple of texts in the Old Testament, the king could be called God's son. And it's true that in an equally small number of texts from the Jewish literature of the New Testament period, the royal Messiah, the expected son of David, is called son of God. But such texts are remarkably rare. They do not, I think, explain why Mark and other New Testament writers give such prominence to the term son of God applied to Jesus. For Mark, as for other New Testament authors, it's the most meaningful description of Jesus. As we can see in the words of God at the baptism, Jesus is God's beloved son. The, the term refers to no mere status or office, but to a profound relationship with his divine father. But out of this relationship, certainly, arises a role and a task for which God at this point is equipping Jesus. For the voice continues, in whom I have been well pleased. And this is a clear allusion to another part of the prophecies of Isaiah, where God says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my spirit delights, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This is the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, anointed with God's spirit, whom God has appointed for a unique role in his history with the world. From now on, Mark's spotlight is on Jesus rather than on the Spirit or the Father. But the baptismal vision has set the stage for this so that we know that the Spirit is now continuously at work in Jesus' ministry and that Jesus is continuously in touch with his Heavenly Father, sustained by his Father's love and carrying out his Father's will to the end. Now we can turn to the Transfiguration. We do need to recall something of what has happened up to this point in Mark's story. Jesus has healed the sick and cast out demons. He has forgiven sins. He has stilled a storm and walked on the water. He has miraculously fed crowds of people. And on the basis of all this evidence, when Jesus asks his disciples, who they think he is, Peter, speaking for them all, is able to say, you are the Messiah. He means, you are the expected king of Israel, the new David. But immediately Jesus begins to explain to the disciples that he is going to suffer and be rejected by the Jewish authorities and put to death before rising from the dead. Peter is scandalised. This is not at all what he thinks should happen to the Messiah. Then, six days later, Jesus takes three of the disciples with him up a high mountain where they are given an extraordinary experience, a moment of revelation. First, they see Jesus transfigured. It's a foretaste of Jesus' divine glory appearing as he will do at his coming in glory in the future. Mark mentions the clothes especially because it enables him to say that they become dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. Heavenly beings in the Bible and the Jewish tradition are always shining, radiating light like the sun or the stars, and their clothes too are dazzling, unearthly in their splendor. Jesus is joined by two great figures from Israel's history, the two great prophets of the past. 
there has been a lot of debate about the significance of this. Why Moses and Elijah? And many suggestions. I think the main point is that Jesus turns out to be not in the same category as Moses and Elijah, but decisively distinguished from them. Peter makes the mistake of thinking all three are, as it were, on the same level. Well, that would have been stupendous enough. Jesus as great and glorious as Moses and Elijah. So Peter suggests making three temporary dwellings, one for each of the three. He may have been thinking that these were the three great figures of the Messianic age. Israel, God's people properly constituted, ought to have three leaders, king, high priest, and a prophet. Peter already knows that Jesus is the anointed king, the Messiah, and it was a Jewish view at the time that Elijah would return to earth as the high priest of the renewed Israel. And then Moses, the greatest of the prophets, would be the prophet in this ideally reconstituted Israel. So Peter makes his inept suggestion of honouring each of them with some sort of tent. Maybe he thinks the messianic kingdom will be inaugurated here on the mountain. But Peter's thoughts are sharply contradicted by the divine voice. Ignoring Moses and Elijah, God specifies Jesus as his beloved son. This is my beloved son. Of course, this is what God had said to Jesus at his baptism. But now he reveals it to the three disciples. And the voice singles out Jesus as unique, not one of a triumvirate of equals, not even with Moses and Elijah. Even Peter's recognition of Jesus as Messiah does not go far enough. Jesus is God's unique and uniquely beloved son. When the three disciples look around, they see that Moses and Elijah have gone, taken up in the overshadowing cloud. But Jesus is still there with them. He's the one to whom they should listen. Now, when we recall what happened just before the transfiguration, Peter's confession of Jesus as Messiah, and then Jesus' prediction of his future suffering and death, and Peter's well-meaning, scandalized reaction, then there's something else to be said about Moses and Elijah. Both of them faced bitter opposition. Their ministries were attended by rejection and suffering, so far like Jesus. But for neither Moses nor Elijah did the opposition lead to violent death. Moses died peacefully and honoured at an advanced age. Elijah was taken up to heaven on a chariot. But for Jesus, the bitter opposition he is to encounter will lead to his being put to death, as he has just recently tried to get across to Peter and the others. Paradoxically, being the beloved son puts him in a special category that entails his violent death. God did not let Moses or Elijah suffer such a fate, but his unique and dearly beloved son, him God will hand over to mocking and torture and an abandoned death. Jesus had said that to Peter, but Peter would not listen. So now the divine command comes. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is why the command comes at this point in Mark's story, when Jesus has begun to teach the disciples about his coming passion and death. It's what they don't want to hear and don't want to understand. So they are told to listen as Jesus goes on teaching them what being the beloved son is going to require of him. Certainly, 
they will see him again in heavenly glory, but not yet. The transfiguration was only a foretaste, a memorable, reassuring, overpowering foretaste of the ultimate future beyond the cross. But first the disciples must follow Jesus um, on his way to the cross. So we come to the third moment of Revelation, which is the moment of Jesus' death. Two quite different things happen, and really it's only for us, the readers, that they compose a single revelatory moment. The centurion did not see the temple veil torn in two. Maybe no one at all saw it, or if anyone, just a few priests. The centurion did not speak his remarkable insight for anyone at that time and place to hear, but it is a revelation to us. This is the third time Jesus is declared God's son, but this time not by God, but by a human being who sees Jesus die. Now let's look again at the correspondences between the vision of Jesus at his baptism and the events that immediately follow his death. I mentioned earlier there's a verbal link between the spirit, pneuma, at the baptism, and Mark's way of referring to Jesus' death. He expired, excepusen. Now it has been suggested that Mark intends us to understand that the divine spirit that descended on Jesus at the start of his ministry leaves Jesus at the moment of his death. But this, I think, is not plausible. If Mark meant that, he would have expressed it more clearly. At the literal level, Mark is using an accepted term for dying, where pneuma is the ordinary breath. But what I think is likely is that Mark means this to symbolize the theological truth that the death of Jesus released the Spirit of God into the world. During Jesus' ministry, the Spirit was active only in Jesus' own presence and activity. After his death, the Spirit becomes the Spirit of Jesus Christ at work in his name in the world. The point is not that the Spirit left Jesus, but that the Spirit went forth from Jesus to continue his work, beyond the bounds of his physical presence throughout the world. If that's the case, it may help us with the significance of the next thing that happens in Mark's narrative of Jesus' death. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from the, bottom, from the top to the bottom. There is a wide range of suggestions that have been made as to the significance of this event. I think we can at least take it that again Mark intends us to see a moment of revelation. The rending of the curtain in the temple tells us something about Jesus, as the vision at the baptism does, and as the transfiguration does. In each case, something revelatory is seen by Jesus, by the disciples, by us readers, before a voice is heard declaring Jesus to be God's son. Moreover, we've already noticed the parallel use of the same verb schizo, the tearing apart of the heavens and the tearing apart of the temple veil. And in discussing the baptismal vision, I said that Mark's choice of this word indicates the fulfillment of the prophet's prayer that God would tear open the heavens and come down. I think we should probably see the ripping of the temple curtain as a second stage of that fulfillment of prophecy. There were two curtains in the temple, but the one to which Mark refers is almost certainly the inner veil, the one that separated the holy place where the priests ministered in the presence of God from the holy of holies, the innermost sanctuary, where God himself dwelt. In the picture, you see the holy place, 
that contains the seven branch candlestick, the menorah, the altar of incense, and the table of the showbread. Beyond the veil is the Holy of Holies. No one was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. It was the holiest spot on earth, and the curtain shielded the priests and the people from the dangerously holy presence of God. I suggest we see a parallel between the heavens in the baptismal vision and the curtain of the temple. The heavens, which of course can mean the sky, heavens are a sort of curtain separating God's heavenly dwelling place from the world, while the curtain of the temple separates God's earthly dwelling place from the world. At the outset of Jesus' ministry, God tore apart the, temp the curtain of the heavens in order to come down and be present and active in Jesus. At Jesus' death, he tore apart the curtain in the temple in order to come out and be present and active through Jesus in the world at large. If there was a sense in which God's presence on earth was confined to the temple, this was no longer true. If there was a sense in which his presence on earth in the temple made him accessible to his people Israel, but not to the rest of the nations, that too is no longer true. The point is not that God left the temple, as has often been thought. When the Spirit descended from heaven in the baptismal vision, God did not leave heaven. If the early Christians had thought that God had withdrawn his presence from the temple in Jerusalem, they would not have continued to worship there as they did. God did not leave the temple, but God is now equally present among his people, Jews and Gentiles, wherever they might be. That should make it clear how appropriate it is that the declaration, truly this man is God's son, is made by a Gentile, the Roman centurion. Not necessarily Roman by nationality, but certainly Gentile. He was doubtless there at the cross because he was in charge of the group of soldiers who had crucified Jesus and stayed to see the job properly finished. It may well be appropriate that this de declaration was made by a Gentile, but of course it's also very surprising. It's really hard to tell what brought him to this conclusion. His words are ambiguous in Greek. He could be saying, this man was a son of God, or this man was the son of God. The former would be more plausible in the mouth of a Gentile, of a pagan Gentile. The latter is what the gospel has taught us readers to think Jesus is, the absolutely unique son of his divine father. Maybe Mark intends the ambiguity. The centurion meant as much as he could have understood within his non-monotheistic worldview, but we readers can see that he says more than he meant. The appropriate final revelation of Jesus' unique divine sonship in Mark's story. Mark says, when the centurion saw that in this way he breathed his last, he died, he said, some commentators take this to mean that it was something about the way that Jesus died that impressed the centurion. But I think Mark means only that it was after Jesus had breathed his last. that The centurion gave, as it were, his verdict on this man. I doubt if we can know why he came to that verdict. What we can know, I think, is the significance of this declaration of Jesus' divine sonship for our understanding of Mark's story of Jesus. Remember that for Mark, son of God means much more than Messiah. Throughout the story, many people have considered Jesus to be the Messiah, including the 12 disciples, 
and including the crowds who hailed his entry into Jerusalem. But no human being has said that Jesus is the Son of God. This has previously been said only by God himself in the baptismal vision and at the transfiguration and by the demons who have supernatural knowledge about Jesus. No human being has perceived that Jesus is the Son of God until this point at his death. Mark surely means us to see. We cannot really understand what it meant for Jesus to be the Son of God unless we accept what his disciples found so difficult to accept, that being the Son entailed Jesus' suffering and death. The extreme pain, the extreme rejection, the extreme shame of this sort of death. Jesus was never more the divine son of his heavenly father than when he reached this extreme point of human degradation, reduced even to crying out that his father had forsaken him. Since we readers have heard God himself declare Jesus to be his beloved son, at crucial points in the story and with revelatory power, we cannot doubt that Jesus remains God's beloved, dear to his father's heart, even as the father also leaves him to die in this abandoned way. For Jesus to bear the burden of humanity's sin and suffering, left by his father to die, he had to be acting out of love for his father, fulfilling his father's will and making it his own will. And he had to be sustained by his father's love for him at this supreme moment of their relationship. The three persons of the Trinity are not all explicitly present in the narrative of Jesus' death, but they are all implicit. As the story that began with the baptismal vision, the story of God's Trinitarian involvement with the world, reaches this climactic point. Looking back over the three moments of revelation in Mark's story, the first was a revelation to Jesus by his father, the second a revelation by the father to Jesus' disciples, the third is really a revelation only to the readers, us. Whether the centurion is speaking to his fellow soldiers or just to himself scarcely matters. Mark gives us his words as a revelation to us. We are to see that Jesus is truly the son of God uh, in his death, in the extreme point of his following his father's will for the salvation of the world through him. Having seen that, we can recapitulate the earlier revelations and read them as revelations not just to persons in the story, but also to us. The mere fact that Mark has written them down for us, of course, uh, makes that the case. What in that case do we make of the second moment of revelation, the one that climaxes with the words, this is my beloved son, listen to him. How do we listen to Jesus? I said that for the disciples, this meant listening to what Jesus had to say about his path to crucifixion and resurrection. It doesn't mean, or at least it doesn't mainly mean, listen to Jesus' teaching in general, though I have no wish to downplay the importance of Jesus' teaching. It means rather listen to Jesus' story the whole of his life and ministry, and especially his path to the cross and his subsequent resurrection. Attend to that. The moments of revelation that frame the story are really telling us the whole story is revelation to which we must attend. Thank you.